Hey Bay Church, welcome to our online experience. I'm Apollo. And I'm Katrina. That's right. Make sure you go in the comment section below and comment what city you rep. I'm from Brentwood myself. And I'm repping Pittsburgh. That's right. So make sure you send some love, comment down below, click some hearts. Let's have a good time today. Yes, show us some love in there. You can hit that heart button. You can hit, give, send an emoji. Just let us know that you're with us. We also have people live in the chat that are ready to answer any questions that you may have. And if you're new here and this is your first time, we would just like to say welcome to the family. We want to connect with you personally and send you a gift. So go ahead and click on welcome in the menu, top right, mobile users, top left. That's right. And today we're actually wrapping up our 10 commandment series that Pastor John has taken us through. He's actually speaking on the 11th commandment. Did you know there's an 11th 11. commandment? That's right. In Pastor John's message there is. Not in the Bible, but in Pastor John's message there is. So make sure you tune. It's going to be a good time. Also, Pastor John will be taking us through communion today. So make sure you go ahead and reach for the bread, the crackers, the tortillas, the naan, whatever carb your culture uses, go ahead and grab it. We're going to have a good time as body of Christ. Yes, and if you have kids, we have a service specifically designed for them. So go ahead and check out the kids service in the menu. That's right. And my Bay youth, I miss you guys so much. My 6th to 12th graders, make sure you click the link actually in our notes section. It's going to take you to our YouTube page where you will have some worship. You'll have a Devo straight to you. Also, make sure on Tuesday nights you tune in to our Instagram at the Bay.youth where we go live every single Tuesday. Now, let's make sure we stand to our feet, move the couch around. It's time to worship. Let's get it.
Yes, we want to thank you so much for your continued generosity because of your faithful giving. Uh, we're able to partner with God to, to fulfill His plan for the Bay Area. Amen. And here at the Bay Church, we're all about loving God and loving people. That means reaching out to the people who don't know Him yet and maturing those who are already part of the body of Christ. Yes, and with your partnering with the Bay Church, we have been able to reach more people than we ever imagined digitally. And, 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 and the first of many campuses is going to be launched this fall. Come on, how exciting know, is right? that? We get to be a part of that, y'all. Um, so let's keep on going. Let's keep on reaching beyond these four walls and yes. just believe for God to do something phenomenal. We will not stop until the Bay Area knows about the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And as you give, know there's actually three different ways you can give. You can actually text to give. There's going to be a number on the screen. You can also click the give button on your screen that you're watching right now. You can even mail in the check to the address that's in your note section. Uh, let's pray. Yes. Let's do that. Father, we thank you so much for every single person that's tuning in right now. I pray, God, that you would bless their hearts as they give today, Father. As you would bless every single aspect of their life, God, as they devote their faithful giving to you. And we pray, God, that you would take this giving and do what only you can do with it. I pray you expand this beyond these four walls, that you would do something throughout the Bay Area, God, where people would see just how good you are. Father, we love you, we praise you, and pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and let's worship with one more song. Come on.
Hey, everybody, welcome to the Bay. We are here again uh, for a time of Bible study, encouragement, life application, and becoming the women and men God's destined us to be. Thank you for sharing your weekend with me and with the team here at the Bay Church. Now, each weekend when we work our way through these uh, contentments, we have been uh, beginning by reading them through together biblically. Uh, I think that's important that we do that together because it's repetition which embeds in our lives, which at some point will lead to life transformation. And so remember, don't see these as ridges, do's and don'ts. Uh, See them as a father of love and wisdom and goodness. Our Father in heaven saying to you, I love you so much that I don't want you to sin because really, my child, when I say don't sin, I mean don't hurt yourself. Because what God is saying is, I've made you a free volitional creature. That means you have a free will. That means you can make a choice. I can make a choice. We are, in fact, free to make the choices. But watch this. The consequences are built in. That's so important. I need to say that again. We are free to make the choices, but the consequences are built in. Okay, so let's go ahead and read these through. And wherever you're at, whether you're alone, with family, friends, whatever, on your devices, TVs, whatever, let's read them together. Begin. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, and you shall not covet. You know by now probably that the first of these four contentments have to do with our relationship with God, and the remaining six have to do with our relationship with each other, how we treat one another and how we care for one another. We've learned along this journey that you and I have to obey the principles of God to receive the promises of God. I will just say as a fellow human being, uh, as a brother, as a fellow believer, um, that I long the best for you. I long that there be good and blessing and happiness and fulfillment in your life. So I encourage you to make wise choices in your life that align with these principles that we've been unpacking these days in this series on the Ten Commandments. Because when we make choices that align with biblical truth, we position our lives to be recipient of the blessings of God and the promises of God. Okay? Now, as you look through these Ten Commandments that we've just read together, And you'll notice this on your notes. By the way, there on your screen, you'll see a place where you can access notes. Notice that every violation of every one of these life-giving relational principles, all 10 of them that we just read through, that when we violate those principles, it ultimately is a violation of love. It's a violation of love. Did you know that? Even in the first four, when we violate those in some ways, we are violating, compromising, diluting our love for the Lord. When we do with those remaining six, similarly, and we violate them, and we begin to take advantage or marginalize one another's value, we are violating love. It's so important that we understand this as we look at the 11th commandment today. The 11th commandment is, in fact, love. Love. But you probably guessed that, didn't you? It's critical that we understand this, that love fulfills the Ten Commandments. The first four, loving God. The remaining six, loving each other. And Jesus himself in the New Testament summarized these Ten Commandments as loving God and loving people. And you'll notice in just a moment, you'll see where in Matthew 22, he fully, without reservation, uh, reinforces that principle. Love is the 11th contentment, okay? 
Uh, one of the uh, individuals I've enjoyed over the years is a pastor by the name of Juan Carlos Ortiz. He is a pastor from the great nation of Argentina, and he's written about love and faith communities and God's ultimate agenda in the world today, and he writes this. He says, quote, the Holy Spirit's doing a new thing today. He is regrouping Christ followers. What do I mean by regrouping? Up to now, we have been grouped for these 2,000 years by denomination. We were Methodists, we were Lutherans, we were Assembly of God, Presbyterian, Holiness, Nazarene, Roman Catholic, Salvation Army, Episcopalian, Plymouth Brethren, Baptist, on and on and on. But now, Ortiz says, the Holy Spirit is grouping us into two categories only those who love one another and those who don't. He's doing it not by our doctrine, but by the way that we live together and how we love one another or don't. He continues, you know, the sheep and the goats are the only two groups that God knows in the New Testament. You may remember that parable of Jesus in the latter chapters of Matthew. He goes, in Argentina, actually, there are many sheep. He goes, sheep are easy to tell because they always huddle close, their heads are always together, and they're like one tight body. But then we also have in Argentina plenty of goats. The goats are very different from the sheep because the goats have their backs to one another, not their heads, their backs and they're bucking and kicking one another constantly. You don't need the gift of discernment to know in Argentina what is a sheep and what is a goat. Just watch their behavior. Jesus wants us to be one, he concludes. Just as the Holy Trinity is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so he wants us to be one. He wants this not only in evangelistic efforts and in fellowship meetings, he wants us to love one another as a family in every denomination, in every city, in every country, in all the world, unquote. Let's talk about five insights about what this 11th contentment actually looks like? How does it play out in our lives, yours and mine, day by day? First of all, love summarizes the 10 commandments. I referenced this a few moments ago, but I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Again, Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. These are the words that Jesus spoke when he responded to a question. They said to him, teacher, which is the most important commandment? And what they were asking him is, of the 10 Jesus in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20, what would you say is the most important one? Because they were forever trying to trap him and trick him. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, the first two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament, is teaching us how to love God and love one another. But then God puts on skin. God becomes flesh in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ and lives love before our eyes. We see love demonstrated as humanity had never seen it demonstrated before or since. Did you see Jesus' words there in Matthew 22? Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God, the first four commandments. Love your neighbor, the remaining six commandments. Loving God and loving people. Now notice, loving God and loving people. Have you ever seen that anywhere around the Bay Church? In our culture, in our communication, et cetera, et cetera, online, social media? It is our biblical mission. A year ago, we took the previous year and a half prior to do a church-wide rebrand. 
for us to think after decades of existence to research the scripture, to pray much, to talk endlessly and say, are we aligned with biblical truth? Are we on task in keeping with the mission that God has given us as a faith community? And we identified, we re-upped once again that loving God and loving people, which Jesus said are the most important things, are and will always be the biblical mission of the Bay Church. Here it is. Loving God is loving people. Loving people is loving God. Number two, love authenticates the message of the gospel and the purpose of the church. Check it out with me. I'm in John 13. These are the words of Jesus. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, people will know, they will see demonstrated, there'll be no denying that we are Christ followers if we love one another. I love what little kids say about love. Here's some of their insights, what love is. Uh, One little girl by the name of Rebecca, age eight, says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Carl, age five, says, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. Well, yeah, that's a version of love, I guess, as well. Danny, age seven, said, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she always takes a sip before giving it to him just to make sure that the taste is okay. Bobby, age five, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you'll only stop opening presents and listen. True that. This is Elaine, age five. Love is when daddy gives mommy the best piece of chicken. Marianne, age four, said, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you have left him alone all day long. Uh, Lauren, age four, said, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all of her old clothes, and then she has to go out and buy new ones. How much she must love me. This is Karen, age seven. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down, up and down, and little stars come out of you. Yeah, sort of like that. And then finally, Jessica, age eight. Uh, You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. When we authenticate the message of the gospel and the purpose of the church by loving one another, it doesn't mean just when we're firing on all cylinders, getting A's and everything, performing well, functioning optimally, etc. It means when we're in the broken, dark, uncertain places of our lives as well. There's been so much written over the the generations about the idea, is the church the only army in the world that shoots its wounded? I mean, I have seen faith communities and individual so-called people of faith utterly discard a fellow sister or brother just because they had a moment of failure in their lives. I mean, how do we respond? Ask yourself the question now, how do you and I respond when believers fail, even when they fail badly? Writes one, quote, one weekend in a local church, the pastor, in a very warm and loving voice, asked Mindy, to come to the platform, and Mindy was a petite, 20-ish girl, and she literally got up out of her seat and ran 
to the platform. And as she approached the front of the church, everyone stood and applauded for Mindy. Then at the same time, two ladies, each holding a dozen roses, stepped out from the opposite side of the platform and gave her the roses. The pastor put his arm around her and said, Mindy, you've been gone for two and a half years. And many of these people don't know who you are. Uh, for you friends who don't know, Mindy, Mindy is one of our own precious girls who's just been released after two and a half years in the Florida prison for women. She was involved in a drunk driving accident, and she's part of our family. Mindy, how many of these people in the past their motion to the audience, how many of these people have written to you or come to see you since you went to prison and were there for two and a half years? She looked up at him with a beautiful smile, and she said, Pastor, I quit counting after a thousand. And this article concludes, this was a church family where the people acted like true believers. Love authenticates the gospel and the purpose of the church. Before I come out and teach you each and every weekend, I have a little saying posted on the wall backstage that says, Father God, there's a broken heart in every seat. Love people through me, flawed vessel though I am. Because the Bible teaches, because Jesus modeled that you and I are always at our best when we are loving or when we're being loved. Let's go to number three. The third insight is this, that love, maximum love, lays down our lives for a friend. Once again, Jesus is the template. Look at John 15, beginning in verse 12. Let me read it to you. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he or she lay down their life for their friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. So love one another. Mahatma Gandhi, speaking in an age of real injustice and uh, just sort of a moment of global tempest, being from the great nation of India, British occupation, made this statement. He said, if we operate by the Old Testament maxim of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he said this in responding. He said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, if we approach life that way, will leave us all blind and all toothless, unquote. Absolutely right. Maximum love lays down our life for a friend. True, biblical, Jesus-style agape love is a love that goes first. It is a love against the odds and against public opinion, a love that forgives, and then it is a love that is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. What's the next insight about love? It's this, love demonstrated proves our conversion. Love is not love till it's demonstrated, till uh, behavior is acted out. And so love demonstrated proves that we are legit Christ followers. Notice with me 1 John chapter 4. It's a powerful passage. Uh, this is written by the Holy Spirit through the apostle John. John, you may remember, was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And Jesus and John had a very loving, mentoring uh, relationship. And, and John, I think, had a, just a beautifully tender heart. And he writes these words in chapter 4 of his first letter, quote, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, and everyone who loves knows God. Now notice this last sentence. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Look at that with me again. Whoever does not love does not know God. I mean, it's cut and dried. No matter how correct the doctrine, 
no matter how correct the religious behavior, no matter how in some sense ethically or morally upright in other contexts, whoever does not love does not know God, John the Beloved says, because God is love. Right now as we have this Bible study together, say that last sentence with me. Uh, even a few times, just kind of whisper it to yourself. Whoever does not love does not know God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And here's how it works. We behave what we believe. We behave what we believe. Uh, if we don't obey what we say we believe, then we really don't believe it. Because for many, our faith in some sense is a theory or a concept. It's not a love affair. And I'm encouraging all of us in this 11th contentment moment to get back up on God's easel and let him continue chipping away at the old nature so that there's less of us and more of him, less of our old behavior and old nature and old prejudices and unforgiveness and bitterness and anger, hostility, and more and more of Jesus. It's like the bright little girl who uh, went to Sunday school and as she's driving home with her mother after a church, she had some questions and they're sitting in the car quietly driving and she asks her mom a question. She's thinking in her little head about what she'd learned in Sunday school that day and she says, Mommy, doesn't God live in us? And the mother said, yes, honey, he does. And then she said, but mommy, isn't God bigger than us? And the mother laughed a little to herself and said, yes, sweetheart, God is bigger than us. And the little girl concluded, well, mommy, if God lives in us and God is bigger than us, shouldn't some of him show through? Exactly. Is some of Christ showing through in your lives. So many people are never going to pick up this book. They live in real cynicism uh, and distrust toward religious institutions or a local church. But when they see authentic human beings that would identify as Christ followers live in a way of humility, live in a way of love, live in a way that's non judgmental, live in a way that has an empowering, servant-hearted approach to uh, one's fellow man and women, uh, that, there's not an argument against that. Let's wrap up today and talk about the fifth um, example or the fifth, the fifth uh, demonstration of love, and it's this. Love's definition is service. In other words, love always does something. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let me read it to you. Many of you know it. Some of you probably even had it at your wedding. Here we go. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but love rejoices with truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. And now these three remain. There is faith, there is hope, and there is love. But the greatest of these is love. And love demonstrated. That's why we talk about being servant leaders in a servant-hearted culture. We're not here to judge the beautiful 8 million people of the bay. We are here to love the beautiful people of the bay, to serve them until they ask us why. And if they never ask us why, that's okay too because we know that God is working through our acts of service, our acts of love, our acts of compassion. Because if you're the real deal in Jesus, your heart will bubble over with love and you will desperately want to do something about it. Let me offer 
a thought about how we share our faith because uh, in my many years of being a servant leader in the local church, I've seen so many different things taught and so many different things advised in terms of how you share your faith. I want you to forget all of that for just a moment and think about how Jesus related to people. Not religious people, very religious people, women, men, people that were culturally or ethnically acceptable, people that were not, people that had a certain pedigree, people that were without any family to speak of. If you actually look at the way Jesus treated people, that's our model, that's our example. So let me put it to you this way in terms of sharing your faith. If you and I had a cut, would you like somebody to come along and rub rock salt uh, forcefully into our wound? I mean, wouldn't that make us feel better? Wouldn't that bring healing and restoration and understanding? No, it would hurt like crazy if they're forcefully rubbing rock salt in a raw wound. How about if somebody came along with gentleness, applied sterile saline solution and some kind of an antibiotic? Yes, truth, but gently and cleansing and lovingly applied. See, both approaches are truth, but it's the form of the truth and how the truth is applied that's the tail of the tape. That's why whenever I see these angry street preachers condemning and cussing and hell fire and brimstoning everybody walking by, except of course themselves, I get so angry. And I have people question me, John, why are you Christians or people of faith so angry at human beings? Why is there so much hate in their heart? I I hear them, I see them, I'm around them, and I'm just like, I don't even want to be in the same oxygen or environment as this person. I got to get out of here. What God is asking us to do is serve people to Jesus, to love them till they ask us why, to simply Love and serve and love and serve and love and serve. And that's the 11th contentment. The five expressions of love. And these summarize the Ten Commandments. We begin with a little uh, vignette by Juan Carlos Ortiz, the Argentinian pastor. I'm going to close with another comment that he makes. It's kind of cute. And it's... uh, I think it's going to be an image that will stick in your mind. Listen. He concludes, quote, We believers are like potatoes. So I could say, hey, you spuds. After the seed potato is put into the ground, the potatoes grow as tubers, three or four to each plant. By the way, I know that this is true because as a boy growing up, I planted potato plants. These potatoes, three or four to each plant little tubers, they are together, but they lack unity. So at harvest time, the potatoes are dug up, they're placed in the same sack. Now, this is still not unity, it is merely regrouping. Yes, they're in the same sack together now, so it's fellowship, but it's not yet unity. Later, when these potatoes are peeled and put together, the little potatoes are speaking to one another and saying, now we are one, no. No, you're not, not yet, because they must be cut, cut. they must be cooked together, because what God ultimately wants is mashed potatoes. And so now there are many potatoes, but they are destined to become one bowl full of mashed potatoes. And when the potatoes are mashed together and in full unity, no single potato can say, look at me, I am bigger than you. That is what the Holy Spirit wants, and that is what the Holy Spirit is doing throughout the world. He is renewing his church with love. He is telling us, let's love one another with all of our hearts. Let's love the beautiful people with all of our hearts and let's serve them because that's the most effective way to evangelize the planet. He concludes, for Jesus prayed that they may be one and that prayer is being answered. Hallelujah. So that wraps up our 
time uh, in Bible study today, I want to pivot and I want us to take a few moments, if we could, and celebrate communion together. You may remember that communion uh, is really a reminder of Jesus' greatest act of love because that little bit of juice and our team members that were part of this weekend's service uh, encouraged you a little bit earlier to get some juice and to get a little piece of bread, cracker, whatever, because we're going to celebrate it right now together, you and I. That little bit of juice represents his shed blood and that little cracker or little piece of bread, it represents his broken body. And as we eat and drink together, we remember the greatest act of love ever demonstrated, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me and for you. He demonstrated his love for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. And so we're going to eat and drink together. And I want to reference uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So just get comfortable where you're there in your car, your living room, your office, whatever the setting may be. You've got your juice. You've got your little bread wafer cracker. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. Would you take that bit of bread or cracker in hand? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember me. So Father, we do pause with this bread or cracker before us. And Father, we understand what it represents, your broken body, that you who knew no sin became sin for us in our place, that we might become the righteousness of God through you. From the bottom of our hearts, we say, thank you. Let's eat together. And then the Bible continues in verse 25, and in the same way after supper. So this is that final meal that they're having before Jesus was betrayed by Judas, before he stood before uh, Pilate and Herod and so forth, before he was crucified the next morning. They're having this final meal together, drinking from a common cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. A covenant is a sacred relationship. Being in his blood is to contrast that in the Old Testament, the blood that was used to provide forgiveness of sin uh, was the uh, blood of animals, actually, in a very sophisticated, complex, almost in some sense, very difficult to understand sacrificial system. And now we have God putting on skin and becoming, in a very real sense, a sin offering for you and for me. A new covenant of grace, not law, grace in his blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray, Father. Similarly, we hold in our hands this bit of juice. We understand that in this moment as we share in communion, we understand that it represents the shed blood of Jesus. And so, Father, as we drink, we understand it. And that song of yesteryear sort of springs to mind that what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so in this moment, Father God, we drink, we remember, and from the bottom of our hearts, we say thank you. Let's drink together. Thank you so much for joining me for Bible study this weekend. Thank you for sharing communion with me because communion implies community, you and I together in him. He loves you and so do I. Have a really great week everybody.
We hope that you were encouraged by the service today. If you are in need of prayer, we have pastors waiting in the chat for you. Just click live prayer and a private chat will start. That's right. And I want to tell you that if you are looking to know God, to find community, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference in the lives of others, then Growth Track is the next best step for you. You can actually access steps one through three all online. They're available to you to complete at any time. And we're going to complete step four at the end of the month where we're going to have a live Zoom call. You'll be able to meet some pastors to find out how you can make a difference. I encourage you not to wait. Take that next step right now. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. week.